Hi, this is History with Andrew Allen, and today is episode one of my series, The Formation of the United States of America, These United States. Before I forget, I include the names of the people I talk about and my sources in the description. The Treaty of Paris on September 3rd, 1783, formally ended the American Revolution, and the 13 states became officially independent of the British Empire. Despite the joy of the victory, many citizens experienced an economic depression after the end of the war. Large areas of farmland had been destroyed during the fighting, tens of thousands of men had spent years serving in the army or the state militia instead of working on their farms or their businesses. Their families may have avoided starvation, but many fell into debt. Still, the economy would undoubtedly bounce back which would fuel an economic recovery. Not exactly. Merchants were now cut off from British markets, especially British colonies in the Caribbean, which had been part of a closely integrated market with the southern states before the revolution. Wait, a peace treaty had been signed, so why were American merchants cut off from those markets? Basically, the British government decided to strangle the American economy. British ships would have to be built in British shipyards, American ships could not sail to Canada or the British colonies in the Caribbean, and Canada and Nova Scotia were encouraged to produce goods for shipment to the Caribbean. Well, two can play at that game. Since the former colonies had been a large market for British exports, the American merchants must have retaliated with a boycott of British goods. Um, no. After a long war, people wanted luxury items, and British merchants were happy to oblige. So, British goods flowed to the States for several years at a rate roughly three times pre-war volumes. Actually, this boom in consumer spending did more than deprive American merchants of leverage. It was a fatal blow to the gunsmiths, forges, and mines that had been created to supply the Revolutionary Army. The new industries hastily expanded during the war could not compete with cheap imports from Britain. Despite the obvious danger of the British trade policy, the Confederation Congress could not force the states to agree to a retaliatory trade war against Britain. Article 9 of the Articles of Confederation specifically prevented Congress from signing a treaty that interfered with the state's power to prohibit the importation or export of any category of good. Admittedly, individual state governments recognized the danger to the American economy from British trade discrimination, and several states imposed duties on British goods, even though working separately they had much less power than if they worked together. To further complicate the situation, the states struggled against each other. In fact, states with poor ports like Connecticut, New Jersey, and Delaware established free ports to lure trade away from Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New York, and Pennsylvania, which had far better ports but had levied harsh import duties on British goods. Aside from the burden of an economic slump, Americans discovered that they would have to pay the cost of their newfound freedom. War is expensive, so both the Continental Congress and the state governments had run up massive debts. Congress owed money to Holland, France, and Spain, but the state governments focused on their debts first, largely because those debts were owed within the state, often to wealthy residents who had influence with the state government. The Continental Congress's need for revenue became serious soon after the war ended, since the first installments on the loans negotiated with France and Holland would be due in 1785. As a result, the Confederation Congress sent the 13 state legislatures a bill for $3 million. Congress could not compel states to pay, but most made an attempt which involved higher taxes. So, the taxes would go up, but what was actually being taxed? Only a few states had ports and there was little manufacturing, so state governments simply levied taxes on people, poll taxes, and farms, land taxes. However, most farmers had little gold or silver. To be clear, they were not poor, since they had land, animals, and crops. They just were not able to convert their land, animals, and crops into cash, so they had to borrow money to pay their new taxes. Farmers would go into debt to acquire the hard currency to pay their taxes, which would mostly flow to bondholders, rather than pay for improved infrastructure. Hard currency for foreign bondholders naturally flowed overseas, while American bondholders would spend much of the money on imported manufactured goods, 
The steady flow of hard currency out of the country made it increasingly harder for farmers to pay their taxes. Artisans and farmers were forced to waste time harassing debtors or arguing over bartered goods instead of simply receiving cash payments. Thousands of farmers lost their farms because they could not pay their taxes. These farmers may not have been rich, but they and their friends and their relatives could vote since roughly 60% of white adult males had suffrage, and they voted in representatives who were in favor of paper money. Seven states began to issue paper money, and similar motions barely failed in four other states. Some of the paper money was actually long-term loan certificates backed by land that paid 6% interest. Naturally, the value of the paper money differed from state to state depending on how it was set up, but it did best in New York where it was roughly equal to gold and silver currency. To be fair, unbacked paper currency fueled inflation in Rhode Island and Georgia. Paper money had support in the lower assemblies of numerous states, but frequently failed to pass the upper house, since the higher property qualifications meant that the members of the upper houses were richer and their wealth largely came from speculation or lending out money. Depreciation would reduce that wealth even though the austerity approach was destroying the economy. This was not an academic debate since the threat of being driven into poverty by crushing taxes made people desperate. In the spring of 1785, the New Hampshire Assembly attempted to pay its federal bondholders and levied a tax that hit farmers especially hard. Dozens of towns reacted by calling for the increased printing of paper money, and armed farmers surrounded the assembly to press their point. The arrival of militia with cannon quickly ended the uprising, but the members of the assembly decided to proceed more carefully in the future. Other states handled the situation better. As president of Pennsylvania, Benjamin Franklin was only partially responsible for the state's monetary policy, but it proved effective. Rather than introduce paper money, Pennsylvania issued negotiable IOUs to pay Congress's debts to in-state creditors, and the creditors could then use the IOUs they received to pay state taxes. While it seemed as if the policy simply erased state debt without actually giving Congress money to pay its foreign debts, the IOUs were accepted as currency within the state, thus increasing the money supply and enabling the economy to grow without inflation. So the state functioned smoothly, and it was one of the few states that paid off its full debt to Congress. Actually, an economic slump was only one of the major problems facing the new nation, Following the end of the American Revolution, the fragile union of states had to cope with regional divisions. In particular, frustration was brewing in the western region on the other side of the Appalachian Mountains, where settlers complained about unfair taxes, lack of security against Indian raids, speculators claiming the best land, and poor transportation networks to get their produce to market. A good example is Pennsylvania, which is essentially a rectangle with Philadelphia located near the side next to the coastal states of New York, New Jersey, and Delaware, with Pittsburgh on the other end, and the two areas are separated by the Appalachian Mountains. As frontier land, the region around Pittsburgh was largely settled by immigrants, and they were represented by William Findlay, an Irish immigrant, Robert Whitehill, the son of an Irish immigrant, and John Smiley, an Irish immigrant. They then worked to revoke the state charter for a bank founded by Robert Morris, the former superintendent of finance during the revolution. Believing that the bank only benefited a few of Morris's fellow investors, Whitehill and Findlay wanted to establish a land bank to issue credit to farmers. Several of the investors in the bank, including Morris and James Wilson, were heavily in debt because of land speculation, so this policy would bankrupt them. Morris dismissed claims that many farms had been foreclosed on due to debt and stated that anyone could get a loan from the bank as long as they had good credit. Clearly, he did not convince the majority of the legislators since they voted to revoke the bank's charter and then refused the following year to reinstate it. Hoping to improve their political representation, several frontier regions wanted to form states. Vermont was struggling to gain independence from New York State, and settlers in the frontier region of what is now northern Tennessee attempted to form the state of Franklin to escape North Carolina. Advocates of statehood for Maine based their claim on underrepresentation in the Massachusetts legislature, distance from state courts, and the legislature's failure to pay attention to the needs of the remote region. 
The key issue was whether individual states would expand or the number of states would expand. This may seem strange, but the existing states were sovereign expansionist states with governments that hoped to expand as far as possible. To be specific, land speculators in the various states owned massive tracts of land in these frontier regions, or rather claimed massive tracts of land, and hoped to become extremely wealthy when their states acquired firm control over those regions. If those regions became new states with their own legislatures, then the speculators could not employ their influence with the legislatures of their own states to enforce their land claims. At first glance, there should have been enough land available since 100,000 loyalists had left the United States and they had not taken their lands with them. Nearly 100,000 people moved from the four New England states to newly available lands in New York and in Vermont. However, the departing loyalists were replaced by new arrivals. Now that the war was over and travel was safe, emigration from Europe restarted. At the same time, Americans moved into new regions taking advantage of new opportunities. It is important to point out that property ownership mattered to people, not just for economic security, but because most states required ownership of property to vote, as well as white skin pigmentation and male gender, and even more property to hold elected office. This requirement meant that people desperately wanted to escape tenant-farmer status and become full members of society with a say in how they were governed. Roughly a third to half of Americans had farmed land as tenants before the revolution, but the path out of tenant farmer status had become harder since the good land was already taken. Land was available in the West, but wealthy landlords had already formed companies to purchase huge parcels of unclaimed land, which they would then divide and rent to new arrivals from England, Ireland, Scotland, and Germany, or tenant farmers from American states hoping for a better life. They would perform the backbreaking labor to carve farms out of forests, and the landlord could then raise the rent, or simply sell it to another investor for a profit. Oh, and the land was already occupied by Indian tribes that viewed the settlers as trespassers. The Ohio region had been ceded by the British to the Confederation Congress, which emphasized opening up the region to settlement because it lacked the authority to impose taxes and revenue from land sales could be used to pay off debts. Oh, and land speculators would get rich along the way. Eager for land, people had already settled in the region without waiting for government permission. The flow of illegitimate settlers threatened the speculators' profits, so Thomas Jefferson was appointed to chair a committee on the development of the new territory. Drafted by Jefferson, the Land Ordinance Law was passed in 1785. The ordinance basically encouraged speculation since the land would be divided into townships, which would be subdivided into lots of 640 acres with a price of a dollar per acre, beyond the means of the average farmer. Instead, speculators based in Philadelphia, New York, and Boston bought large chunks of land on credit. No wonder people just settled there illegally. The speculators were able to ensure that Congress passed a law that benefited them because many members of government or Congress were speculators. A prime example is the Ohio Company of Associates, which included Arthur St. Clair, President of the Confederation Congress, and William Dewar, Secretary of the Confederation's Treasury Board, as well as Henry Knox, Secretary of War. The men who wrote the Northwest Ordinance were also investors in the company for the simple reason that a relatively small group of people took part in government and they had a similar mindset. After leaving Congress, St. Clair was appointed governor of the Northwest Territory. He had married into speculation. His wife was the niece of James Baudouin, recently elected governor of Massachusetts and a fervent speculator. Remember I mentioned that the Indian tribes and the frontier lands viewed the settlers as trespassers? Well, that is because the British government had not consulted with the tribes that actually lived in the Ohio region before handing over ownership to the Confederation Congress. Actually, raids from tribes who disagreed with the land title was not the only threat to the new nation. Unsurprisingly, the British were the primary threat. Would the British invade? risking another expensive war? Probably not, but they still had troops in their forts on the southern side of the Canadian border, even though they were required to abandon the forts by the Treaty of Paris. 
The forts suggested that the British were merely waiting for the inevitable breakup of the temporarily United States and would then invade. While no one wanted another war, the Continental Army had become an impressive military by the end of the war, so it could defend the nation. Except it no longer existed. Although it had happened relatively slowly due to the continued British threat, the Continental Army was completely disbanded, leaving only 600 men under Henry Knox to guard military stores at two depots. Why the rush to disband the army, you ask? The generation of the revolution was strongly opposed to a standing army because a standing army was not viewed as part of society, but an instrument of a tyrannical government. A government could not become a tyrannical government without a standing army, so the easiest way to prevent tyranny was to avoid a standing army. The British government's decision to place British troops in the colonies had been a key factor that had caused the revolution. To sum up, the newly independent states had to deal with Britain's attempt to strangle their economy while struggling to pay off the debts from the war. Making matters worse, resentment was brewing in the frontier regions, which wanted to form their own states because they felt they were neglected by the existing states. So, the states had won their freedom, but faced problems that the government could not handle. I will explain the limitations of the government and the effort to create a new, stronger government next episode. Thanks for listening.